Okay. Okay. So, so where do you want to start? Well, one of the most interesting things that often comes up in interviews with you is that you often admit that you're actually a rather anxious person or that, you know, you connect with people on the show and in the interviews you, you conduct for the show. But in, in real life, it's a bit different. You, you know, you connect to people that you feel self-conscious when doing so. Uh, I mean, not to a pathological extent. I feel like I'm still within the range of normal, but I think I'm on the <laughs> anxious. I'm on the anxious end of normal. Right. Like I feel, you know, I have friends and I'm married and I'm close with my sisters, and you know what I mean. Like I'm yeah. fine, but I experience the world with a lot of um, a lot of anxiety. And, and can I ask, like, what sort of things is it? Just is it small, minuscule type of anxieties? That, yeah, uh, actually, yeah, it's the normal. It's, it's, like, it's the normal. Um, it's the normal, like, oh, my God, I'm not being sensitive enough and listening to this person, or I said something stupid, or, you know, handled something wrong, or fear that I'm going to handle something wrong. Or, and then you'll, you'll worry about yes. the conversation after you have it? or Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, this is something I've thought a lot about. I don't know how interesting it is to talk about, or if, if I can talk about it so interesting, mm-hmm. right? Um, but yeah, like it's been, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been a part of my life. And I feel like as I've gotten older, I've learned to manage it better and so, deal with it better. So it was something from very early on, something innate. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I remember when I was a teenager and just, you know, being uh, not even a teenager, like, like, well, yeah, just very young teenager, like 14, 15 and, uh, and realizing like, oh, you can kind of one way to manage your own anxiety and to get through a conversation with other people is to, is to ask them a lot of questions. And I remember walking to school with with uh, this older, really cool kid named Sam Witten. And the way that I would get through it is I would just ask him a million questions. And uh, and then at some point, I came to realize like the problem with asking people a lot of questions is that they feel really close to you because they've opened up to you, and you feel nothing for them. And uh, and it's almost like a trick you're doing. And uh, and at some point, you know. In my late teens, early twenties, I realized, like, oh, I have to stop doing this. Like, I have to <laughs> learn <laughs> to talk about myself in conversations. So you ha- you had to work ha- on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like that weird thing. If if you ask someone a lot of questions, they often walk away quite happy because you know it's it's enjoyable <laughs> to feel understood. Yeah, um, yeah, and they feel like they've shared. Yeah, and they don't realize it's been more or less one way. I mean, at some point, I think people, pe- some people, like understand the imbalance, but. Um, but you know, for like most of your casual acquaintance kinds of friends that you have when you're in school, like I don't think people thought twice about it. But that's such an interesting thing to have to actually like consciously think about opening up. It, what did what did that look like? Did you you just like? I just got into a lot of situations where I just was very aware that I didn't care about people who who cared about me, which is like an awful experience. That is such an awful experience that once it happens. A couple of times you realize, like, oh, this this can't be. Like, I have, you know, like, you need a strategy so you don't get into that situation. Well, I don't understand what situation. Where, where like, people feel really close to you. I remember this in high school. Like, people feel really close to you who you don't feel close to at all um, and are, are, who are kind of a blur in a way because you're not emotionally invested. I'm using the second person here, but I, I you really could be using the first person. <laughs> uh, and so... You know, it's just it's just really awful to feel to feel nothing about somebody who feels something for you, um, and so so it's been a conscious. It's been it's like a, it is a conscious. I feel like I feel like I'm normal enough that basically like I can take steps. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm not. I don't know. Like I feel like everybody's got their things that they got to deal with, and and this just happens to be one of mine. Is it but, still but, something you think about? Like if you go oh, to just absolutely. like a dinner party or something? Oh, it absolutely is something I think about all the time. I mean, not not in the same way. Like now it's much more like I'm very aware of of like, you know, I just got a lot of opinions all the time about <laughs> stuff. And uh, and I should just really uh, be awake to, to to backing off, you know? And uh, which which I hopefully have fixed or um, you know like it's backing off and sharing opinions no 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 like backing off and listening to other people like not being like well I think this you know that doesn't strike me as the type of thing most people would think 
I would class would would struggle with. Well, that's because I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like you know, you have to have a kind of bossy side to your personality if you're going to decide to start your own radio show and yeah. you know, like get money for it and hire people. Like that's a bossy person, you know. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I know these are opposite things. On the one hand, I'm saying like I'm very bossy. On the other hand, I'm saying like I'm not expressing my personality enough and those are completely opposite things but somehow both of those things are true and both of those are things I really try to be like awake to and not be a dick like, like basically it's just a project of trying not <laughs> not to be a dick of one sort or another and again I feel like to other people I think that might come more easily um, and I don't know like I, I think a lot of people once you get to a certain age you learn with your own flaws are and you're trying not to be as flawed one of the things that i've always wondered about is if there's some sort of odd connection between self-consciousness and and storytelling or, or wanting to tell stories because you look at some of the most recognizable names that have gone through the show the program besides yourself it's it's you know david sedaris jonathan goldstein uh the late uh, david rakoff uh and all share this similar thing, the similar temperament, it seems, where it, it's very self-conscious. Uh, I, Jonathan Goldstein has called it like trying to normalize yourself in the world, having to think about things that most people don't necessarily think about. Have you thought about that at all? Do you think there's a connection? I, I mean, I see it now that you say it. I mean, I think that, um, like, I don't know if it's true in general with people t who tell stories. Like, I don't know what it would be like if you were to get, like, Aaron Sorkin and the creators of, you know, the various TV shows together. Like, I think, you know, I think that this is my taste, you know? Like, I'm interested in people who are like that, and I think maybe that's one of the reasons why people like that ended up on the show. Um, you know? There, there are a lot of people on the show who are not like that, like, very unneurotic, a lot of very unneurotic people. Um, Sarah Koenig is on all the time. Uh, Nancy Updike. Um, Sean Cole. I don't know. As I say that, maybe maybe I'm not even right about this. Um. <laughs> anyway. And as you say in the the same lines in, in interviews, when you talk about this, you say how when you're doing interviews for the radio show or like in a focus type setting, that is somehow different. Where um, you do feel connected or more in the flow of yes, interaction than of course, but it's a much more it's a much more um, organized kind of uh, um, human situation. Like it's clear what we're there for. It's clear why we're talking, and it's clear what we're talking about. And uh, and I know what I'm doing, I, you know. And and so it's much simpler than you know the free floating like you know how are we getting along? What do I say next? What do you say next? Of like hanging out with somebody. Right. Um, which usually goes fine, but it can include moments of like, what are we talking about now? Yeah. Or what you know? am I supposed to share about myself? Or yeah, kind of. Yeah. If you're on a long road for well, 10 hours of, with yeah. one person. Yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I think the fact that I was so self-conscious, you know, about how to get a conversation to happen uh, made you know helped me as I tried to figure out how to make a conversation happen on the radio. Like it's 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 obviously connected. The fact that I became interested in having these moments on the radio that would be intimate. You know, like like I think that one of the reasons why I gravitated towards that was because I could feel the power of that. You know, and I think that that I was driven towards it because. Uh, partly, well, partly just because it's interesting to listen to, and and I was ambitious and was trying to do a nice job and make things that were interesting to listen to. So, so it's just objectively interesting. But then, but then, lots of things would be interesting. I think that that's the kind of interesting that I ended up with because some part of me just it felt good, you know, to to do that, to have those kinds of conversations and get them on the air, and and uh, yeah. I don't know, like talking about it this way, it all sounds way more uh, pathological than my experience <laughs> of it is. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I feel like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like I feel way more normal than this conversation <laughs> and have friends and, you know, like things are going fine. 
um, <laughs> you know, I'm seeing somebody for dinner tonight, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's and I know it'll be fine, you know. Um, so, yeah. Is it, is it strange at all? Um, you've, you've become a pretty public figure and radio is, is such a medium in that it really, like they're talking, the host is talking into your ear. It, it really feels when you're on the other end of it as the it, listener. Is it strange that I'm having this conversation with you? You're a total stranger. Like <laughs> I'm talking about something so personal. Is no, that what you're asking? No, yeah. not at all. Actually. I, I just mean when you meet people who've heard the show, but they're meeting you for the first time. Yeah. Is it odd in that? They have they've built out this conception of who you are just naturally. Like one can't help it but do that when you listen to someone a lot. It's not radio. odd for me. It's I think not. it's more odd for them because they're you don't necessarily meet their expectations in, in a real interaction. Or what do you mean? I think when you meet somebody you've heard on the radio or you've seen in the movies or something, you have a feeling about them that's more complicated that can be expressed in the like the one minute interaction you're about to have and and so you feel more connected to them than they feel to you and it's hard to know how to get across to them what that connection is about like to the famous person it's very odd meeting meeting the fam- meeting people who like you admire you know if you express and, and, it and to I've them. Had, and I've had that experience like a lot. Not a lot, but like in the last 10 years, like I never had it ever. Well, you've never met, met someone you was, admired. Or... Well, I've met people who I admired, yeah. You know, and and uh, including like actors and, and writers who who didn't seem like the sort of people who a person would, like Michael Shabon, who's such an amazing writer. And I feel like my feelings about some of his books are so thorough. Like his book that takes place in Alaska is one of my favorite things I've ever read. And, uh, but it's hard to know, like, what to do with that in a conversation. Do you know what I mean? On both and, sides. On both sides, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and for him, too. Like, and uh, Billy Collins, the former poet laureate, said that one of the most inevitably disappointing experiences is meeting the author. And I think that goes for the radio person, too. Um, and I feel like it's a harder situation for, for somebody who's a fan of the radio show in that situation than it is for me, because to me, it's just like, it's a perfectly pleasant thing to have somebody come up out of the blue and say, like, hi, I like your work. It's like you're getting a pat on the head, like you're a dog that's getting a biscuit in the middle of the day. You know, like, and I think if you were, you know, Tom Cruise and every single person who catches your eye needs to say it to you, that would be weird. But, like, I'm so not at that level. You know, it's like a person every couple of days, you know, will, will walk up to me and usually they're like a kind of, you know, perfectly nice seeming glasses wearing, utterly civilized, non groupy, completely adult person who it would, seems like they'd be perfectly pleasant to have a conversation with. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. like they seem like utterly appropriate people to, to be listening to the radio show. And sometimes they're teenagers and sometimes they're old people. And it's just like, you know, it's, it's completely, it's a very low stakes thing. It's utterly pleasant. And, uh, and it's easy to be nice. You know, it's not. It's a nice thing for somebody to want to say to you. Before we were talking about empathy and, and sort of how you see empathy in reporting as something that is both, there's probably not enough of it, but also that it's something that, that's good. It's, it's good to empathize with people, even ones that aren't necessarily on the face of it likable or, or even ethical at times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I mean to say I don't think there isn't enough empathy. I mean, I think a lot of reporting is organized around like a fundamental empathetic act of trying to understand somebody else. I think there, there is, but I, th- there could be more mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. And, and I think that that's one of the things that really distinguishes your program is at the end of the day, it, it seems to be about empathy. And I'm thinking of from so many different vantage points. I mean, there was even back with like teenage Steve Forbes impersonators, like the Republican candidate who wanted uh, a yeah. flat tax to the uh, car salesman in the 129 cars episode. Oh, I love this guy. Yeah. You, oh and, God. you can tell we love them. Like the staff and I like that. Who went out there. You can tell like how much we enjoyed them and they enjoyed us. I think some of them anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And I think my favorite example is actually one of the most recent shows, Call for Help, where you you speak with um, a young family who went out to sea. They were going to live for a few years uh, out at sea, and they had a young baby. And what ended up happening is the the baby started to get sick, and then a bunch of a small storm caused the boat to have some damage, and and they ended up having to call for call for help. And um, you explain in the story how. You, and you actually show some clips of how the public, a lot of the public, was 
outraged. Their reaction was outraged. Hated their guts. Yeah. Just hated their guts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, saying, uh, well, maybe you can describe it because they actually tell you about some of the reaction they get in, in letters and in emails. Like they, people said terrible things. Right. To people them. were just like, how dare you take a child on a trip like this? Whereas it turns out what they did was like totally nothing special. <laughs> like people do it all the time. And, uh, and because of your your irresponsible parents and you're endangering your children and they were rescued at sea and you should pay back all the money that was spent to rescue at sea, which is probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, uh, you know, people get rescued from sea. It's a thing that happens. And as a country, we take that on for our citizens. And... Uh, and just people ha- just hated their guts. That people really hated them. Even people in mainstream media. You, oh like, yeah, 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 yeah. We play cl- we we play a clip on the show. I mean, they're they're they, it's not like hated them, but there's like a tone of condescension, mm-hmm. like and and of like jocular condescension of like you know. I would know better. Or... Yeah, there's like like a uh, a really wonderful ABC correspondent who's like one of my journalistic heroes, Martha Raddatz, who was so good in the presidential debate. She's such a like a like a stand up reporter. Um, you know, it's morning, and it's like this is like one of twelve stories that she's into, or you know, I guess not. That was her report, and she she sort of makes a joke with George Stephanopoulos, the anchor of the Morning News, where she's just like, I don't, you know, take a kid on a boat, like I don't even like to have him around a swimming pool, you know, I keep my eyes on them, and you know, it's just like there's an era of like the whole thing became a referendum on their parenting style, and um, and uh, and they contacted us actually, they were like, uh, we keep you know we keep getting asked to be on morning TV, um, but we've heard your show and we would trust you guys to do the story. And so um, so we're just like, okay, this isn't usually our kind of thing, but yeah, okay, let's let's do it. And, uh, and in the week before the show, we kept getting calls from Good Morning America and one of the other morning TV shows in the States, like wanting clips in advance and wanting, you know, we just felt like, you know, we didn't give it to them. And... Uh, you know, I'm glad that they felt like that, like they had heard the show enough that they felt like they would be treated fairly, like and respectfully, and and not sensationalistically. I mean, I think there are other people who could have done that with them, as well. You know, but you know, they happen to be our listeners and not like Anderson Cooper's or something mm-hmm. viewers or something. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, that's nice when that happens. I think what was so interesting for me to listen to that story, even in the setup, I could even feel like, yeah, like, why would they do that? That doesn't make any sense. Like, as like just the listener, you could, you almost have that. Uh, you get mad. You got, you hated them. Well, not, you know, fully, but like, you can feel like that small part of you wanting to like judge them. And then like, no one, I feel like virtually no one in the world after hearing that story could possibly point their finger and say like, how could you? Or like, yeah, you know, they don't seem irresponsible. They seem like super responsible, really thoughtful, yeah, really capable, you know? Yeah, yeah. They you, you come out of it feel like, oh, you guys are pretty good parents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Had you heard that story? No. Yeah, I had missed it. Yeah, it wasn't a big story, but it was an international story. Like, like it got covered all over the world for some reason. But uh, I was wondering. So, do you think that the empathy that comes across in the show? Do you think that's because of? The founding ideas behind the show, or the, the disposition of, of you and the other producers, I mean, is it I think because of the medium? I, is it? I think it's all these things. I think it's my taste. I think it's the thing that radio does, especially well. You know, the fact that you don't see the people, the fact that if somebody's talking from the heart, just just it's hard not to relate. Um, and so, so I feel like it's both my taste, but also. Do you know we're trying to make the most powerful thing that you can, like, as powerful as we can make it, like, that you can make on the radio. And that's one of the things that radio is great at. So we feel like everything that radio can do, we want to exploit. Mm-hmm. You know, like, let's use let's use it for its full power. And so that's, you know, so we really, really lean on that a lot. And truthfully, like, if you don't relate to the people, like, either a story doesn't feel like anything. You know, like, we had this... We had this story about this pedophile, like, the week after or the week before that story it was like we were working on them both at the same time and uh you know if you think about like what's the least relatable character who you could ever imagine in a story it's a pedophile and uh but the one who we found or who the reporter found was this teenager who realized like oh i i want to have sex with much younger children and he realized, like, this is wrong. Like, I don't want to do this. And then he went looking for help, and there's nowhere to get help. And they don't, it's not even clear how to treat people like that. And also, like, if the therapist thinks you might actually molest a child, the therapist is required by law to turn you in. And so you're putting yourself in danger even to go seek help. 
And he just tells a number of stories, especially one about going to see a therapist where, where he tells it's very touchingly about like he doesn't want to be this way. He agrees with the listener, like this is not a way to be. And uh, so he wants to be fixed. Like, that's it. Fix me. Like, I'm ready. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and there's something in his tone about it where you really believe his sincerity and, uh, and you feel for him. You know what I mean? And without that, um, there's no story. You know, because like, uh, without it, it's just like it's uh, just somebody walking through events. Where, whereas, you, you know, as soon as you relate, then, then, then the whole thing has power. You know, which is why I, I remember early on when we were first on the air and still sort of figuring out what we are. Like one of the things you can do is like you can do stories which kind of mock people a little bit. You know, like not in a mean way, but just in a kind of like chidey sort of way. And there's a lot of broadcasting which does that and especially TV and like you know and people whose work I love like I love David Letterman but there's a lot of like man on the street making fun of people on the street mm-hmm. kind of stuff which is fine like I I'm you know he should do he's great he's awesome <laughs> but it's just not our thing and uh and especially in the kinds of stories that we do I feel like you like it just seems like you're you're going for something cheap and 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 not doing something which could have so much feeling and so you know like and just really just get to you in a really nice way, and it just seemed like that it just you know just wanting to make something that that feels special and feels like more and gives you more as a listener that's 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 the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I imagine you'll recoil from from this suggestion, a bit, but do you think uh, it's important we have venues like that where? I mean, you really do get to empathize with people that otherwise, even if their stories are told in in a newspaper or a magazine article, it's not as it's not as visceral, or the the empathy doesn't quite have that same impact. I mean, I have to say, like, I, there are plenty of magazine writers, and you know, like, there are plenty of good journalists out there, and you know, and and when I read Michael Lewis or or Susan Orlean or or Elizabeth Colbert or or Colbert, however she says her name, or like a lot of writers who I read who I just feel like, oh my God, you're doing such a good job at this, at mm-hmm. this exact thing you're saying. So so I don't think you know, like like but but I think like on radio it's so easy to do. Like whereas you have to be really talented in print to do it. Whereas with us, like, you know, we send out the intern to get tape and it has that quality. You know, like it's just the thing that radio does when it's not trying to do anything in particular is it makes that connection. And it creates that empathy, and uh, it's just the default position. It's just this is what it does. That's what radio is, mm-hmm. and um, and that's as you know, and that's as true, you know, on Rush Limbaugh as it is on Howard Stern as it is on as it is on our show. You really like, think it's the same on on Rush Limbaugh? Oh, I totally do. Yeah, like he's a really interesting character. Like he's interesting. Like he's talented and interesting. But I mean, the, the situations they're talking about aren't exactly um, who you relate. He's the character who you relate to right, in every situation. Right. But the the subject that they're often talking about is some other who doesn't get on tape. You no, know? no, no. Like, and he is not. Oh, he is not sympathetic with many, many people. Yeah, right. Like, he doesn't necessarily have his his empathy is selective for sure. Um, but but it's hard to listen and and not want to kind of be on his side. You mm-hmm. know. Um. Yeah, this is the laws of radio. Anyway, so so um, you're asking, is it important that there's a place like that? I mean, I think it's something that I think it's something journalism can do. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think I think I think I think there are a lot of things that journalism is incapable of doing. You know, and generally, like, not that capable of creating social change by itself. Like we talked about that, like you know, I think you need political organizing to create social change, and media can be in there too. But like, that's not that's not what it does naturally. I feel like what it does naturally is gives you information that you didn't know that makes you think about something differently, which is very rare. Like if you think about like how often have you ever heard anything on the radio like that flipped you on any issue on the war or on the economy or on climate change or on God or on abortion, like who listens to the radio and their opinion flips. But but there can be factual things that kind of like nudge you one way or the other on, on a smaller issue. Mm-hmm. And then like it can make you empathize with somebody and understand something differently. So then when you hear about it in the news, you see it more sympathetically and more complicatedly. Yeah. Like, I mean, especially with Harper High School, I mean, I think that changed how how a lot of people who listen to it, how they will read 
you know, there's just another gun shooting in the, the paper. Yeah. I mean, you can't really and see And it had that. that effect on us. Like, like for those of us who are putting it together, I feel like when we read about gun shootings now in, in school, like, we, we see it through those kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you and know, it's we, sort of neutral, like, the type of, like, let's just get tough or, like, you know, lock them up and throw away the key. It, it seems like you couldn't have that attitude, at least not as easily after, after hearing an episode like that. I don't know about that. There you're going a step further. Than <laughs> All right. I think I think if you think the way to deal with it is to get tough, you would hear Harper high and you would think somebody needs to get tough with those kids. You think you think that some people would have that reaction? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Like somebody needs to go into the neighborhood and kind of be the Marines. You after, know? After really listening to the show though, you, you really Yeah. Like I feel like that's something think, you could you could come away with after reading about it, but like after hearing those those kids' voices. It just seems so implausible. I mean, aside from, you know, one or a few isolated cases, it seems like the vast majority, like 90%, would come away saying, you know, wow, that's a big problem. I don't know how to fix it, but, like, we can't just have some sweeping thing, like tougher gun laws or something, or tougher uh, minimum sentences, and that's going to solve it. I mean, not necessarily tougher minimum sentences, but just, like, more cops. I think a lot of people would come out of that feeling, like, there should be a cop on every corner all the time. You know? Like, make it like, you know, make it like the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. <clears throat> you know, that that would, like, make it safe. Get tougher. Like, I, I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's crazy either. Like, I, it's not what I would think, but anyway, but... But it gives a, a voice, a sort of a feeling to... But you would be doing it out of compassion for those kids. Right, I guess that's what I'm trying to say, is, but that has actual an actual impact. Once you have compassion, yeah, it, it does change things. I mean, I think that that's something the radio can do is it can have compassion. And like, is it important? I don't know. Like, I don't know if it's important. It's important to me. You know what I mean? Like, I like that. Yeah. Like, I, I, I appreciate it when when there's reporting that other people do that give that to me. I appreciate it. I feel like, oh, I finally see inside this thing that was a little opaque before. You know, get close enough up. Like, there was just a story about the, like about this in, in The New Yorker, about this thing that's been in the news for weeks and I was like oh my god this is the first time somebody wrote about this where I finally understand the players and what this is and and I and I totally had the experience of like oh I finally like they they sort of introduced me to the characters in this big national news story in a way it was like oh finally I understand what this is in a human way and I, I feel like I have an actual thought about it you know which and is it, what good storytelling is, yeah, is yeah. basically, you've said, which I think is a really good definition. It's it's taking you into this universe that you know exists, but, you yeah, know. You haven't been that close up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it makes it, po- like any story, which it makes it possible to to think like, well, if I was in this situation, like I would, you know, that I would feel the way they do, you know. I saw this video with you uh, online where you gave a, a speech Um was that a solve for X? I think it was called, and yeah. you, you were talking about climate change, and I found it really interesting um, because it almost goes against what a lot of the stuff you say say normally. Um, it, to paraphrase, you you, you basically said uh, at one point with climate change, it's like this meteor heading towards the Earth, and we we know it's coming somewhere in the back of our minds, and it's coming in like a few decades. But on most days, what are we doing, or what am I doing? You say like nothing, you know, and you go on to say like. As a, as a journalist, as a reporter, I feel like any day that I'm not working on this is sort of pointless. Well, kind of, yeah. yeah. Like you're missing the big, we're missing the biggest story there is. So is that true? Like, is it something you think about most days or like in the back of your mind? Is, is it something that's there? I go through phases of that, sure. Yeah, like right now I'm a little busy like on other projects. And so that thought hasn't had a second to intrude. But um, but in general, yeah. Yeah, I feel like, um, <clears throat> and I've talked to other people who report on climate change about this and people who report on it sort of famously and they say it's weirdly resistant to journalism as a story um, because there isn't something you can do as a as like a person like if you change your light bulbs it's not gonna stop it you know what I mean Mm -hmm. (laughs) to like the better light bulbs you're you're like you're not gonna it's still gonna happen which makes it so terrifying because it's not just yeah it's not just one person it's like massive social change like everything like the way we run our economy needs to change the way we structure our cities needs to change Mm mm-hmm the way they make food, the way, it's just like everything about our entire culture. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's a real problem. And it's coming really soon, too. Like, and, and now we're at the point where, like, you know, the UN just came out with this report a couple of weeks ago, which is like, oh, by the way, like, not only is it happening, but uh, there are going to be wars and food shortages. People are going to die. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> just like, and it's not like 100 years from now. It's like, you know, 
when your kids are your age, basically, that's what it is. So, you know, when your kids hit 40, basically, that's that's when we're talking about. It's super soon and uh, where some of it starts to happen. And so, yeah, it's a it's a puzzle. I feel like I haven't I haven't given the right amount of time to to figure out how to do or if you can do something in this job. Well, one of the things that struck me is uh, it seems so impossible because what you often say is, A, we're out for, for fun and we're not ashamed to be out for fun. You know, we're trying to tell stories that amuse ourselves. And, yes. you know, if you if you don't do that, then the audience won't be amused either. It won't be entertaining. So that's one problem. But the second part is climate change isn't surprising, at least not at the macro level. Well, that, that is the problem. Like, that's the problem with doing it as a story is that everybody knows where they stand. Yeah, it's like, yes, we know and we're so, screwed. And there's like, I don't need the exact details on the level of screwedness. Like, I got it. Like, you don't have to like you, you had me, at the, you know, like. I like used to say at the beginning of the hour or the beginning of the story, like, okay, it's going to be about climate change. If you're like, I know, I know how I stand. Like, I know the story. Like, I know, I know what's going to happen in general. Like, I might not know the details that this particular story is going to tell me. And so, and so whenever we take it on, we try to like find some new corner of it that nobody's written about and some new way to think about it. But, um, but honestly, like the brute force fact of it, you know, the crude fact of, how doomed we are. Um, it's hard to keep repeating that and have it have any feeling. And hard to keep thinking that too. Yeah. It struck me because, you know, uh, as someone who, myself, who's starting out and you have all these ambitions, basically, it seems so strange. Like, you know, it, it, it really seems like it trumps everything else. You know, like why commit yourself to other things? It's just a, such a, a strange problem. And I think you you articulated something that I imagine a lot of people are, are thinking. But on the other hand, I think that maybe um, if somebody's really committed to dealing with climate change, what they shouldn't be is a radio producer. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think, like, I don't think that, though, I, like, I don't know. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what there is for us to do because people who know that it's out there, like the the word is out, like it's not like it's, you know what I mean, like it's widely known, mm-hmm. and uh, and so, and so. I mean, it was interesting at that conference because that conference was people brought together by Google, who are trying to do what they call moonshots, basically technologies that will just change everything, and uh, and there were a number of people there involved in some really interesting climate change stuff. And Google itself has a lot of investments in uh, wind power and solar power, and you know, and and there was a guy there named Bill Gross who's got a really interesting project going, which seems like it really could make solar power really um, w- cheaper than uh, fossil fuel power, which is the thing that they keep trying to do. As soon as as soon as it becomes cheaper to take energy from the sun than it is to dig it up from the earth, and suddenly like the whole everything changes, right? Yeah. And so he's in the middle of this project, this pilot project, and you know, to basically. Which in such ingenious ways, like tries to make it cheaper, and um, you know, there's people like that, and there's people who who have projects where they want to just take carbon dioxide out of the air and convert it into oxygen, just with huge machines, you know, and so just like, let's just let's just engineer our way back to what the atmosphere used to be. That'll be our job, which is a really interesting thing to to think about, and uh, and I came out of it feeling like. Feeling something that I've never really, a thought I've never really had before, but I think is a really common one in the world of Google and and the people at that conference who were inventors, engineers, and billionaires, um, which is uh, which is government is not doing a good job with this at all, right? Like government is paralyzed, and uh, and uh, and so this is a job for the free market. This is a job for you know the guys who put together you know Google Maps. Basically, you know, like this is a job for people with like a lot of capital and kind of a do goody feeling and a lot of ambition. Which isn't really capitalism. I mean, you you'd lose a lot of money if you just say, Well, I'm gonna make a million of these machines that that will take carbon out of the air for free, <laughs> you know, if there's no government paying you to do it. I think I think once you have the machine you get somebody to pay you. You know. Like I think I think but even then, it could only I be think a big, they, they big, think, big institution that that could do it, like a public institution, really. Yeah, or just like a bunch of rich guys just decide yeah, to save the world. Well, let's save the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So you've thought about doing more uh, about it or more reporting about it, it, it sounds like? I've thought about more reporting, and every now and then I'll look into a story. Um, but but it's, uh, it, it hasn't gone very well. Um, because of those those same problems with the... Yeah, it's yeah. hard to find a story. It's hard to, hard it's hard to, to find a story that I think is worth people listening to. Mm-hmm. So. In the first year of This American Life, it sounded like... I mean, you've, you've grown to such a, a huge sort of international show, but in the first year, it actually sounds like your future was uncertain or you felt it was uncertain. You know, in the air, it sounds that way. No, 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 saying? no. Like you, you said at the time that it felt... Uh, oh, of course it did. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Like even within the first few years? Yeah, of course. Because it took off very quickly. I mean, it didn't take Relatively long. speaking, but but, you know... We started in November of 95, and, and we thought we were going to be a national show. We were basically just going to do the show locally for a couple months until we got it down. So you had that confidence already that it was going to get picked up? There's no getting picked up. It's not... The, the, well, I guess the, our system here in the States... Individual stations here we, and there. Basically, yeah. I mean, this is, the, this is one of the ways in which we are superior to the Canadian <laughs> public radio system, which, though Canada is, is superior, and people are better trained, the shows are better... It's more consistent. It's older. It's more loved. More people listen. <laughs> so you guys kick our ass in so many scores. But this is the one way that we compete, and that is that uh, anybody can start a show, and you can just have talk stations into picking it up. And so uh, there's no there's no central like council of commissioners or something that decides. It's super democratic. And so out of the chaos, like you know, you know, like somebody, you know, it's just very little money actually. You know, can start a show and just start talking stations at taking it. And I remember to get on the satellite at the time that we started the show cost like 140 bucks a week. You know what I mean? So you you could do it yourself. You wouldn't even need a, you know, a schmancy network or something. <laughs> you know, you'd just buy the satellite time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, like, like at the beginning, what it seemed like is, is uh, this is something that, this is the kind of show that I personally would like. And Toy Malatia, who started the show with me, like he was just like, this show is to our taste. And it seemed like, well, maybe that's what this will be. This will be like like one of those little movies that like certain people like, most people never hear of. And, uh, you know, we'll do it for a couple of years and then like go do something else. And uh, So you, you expected to do something else? I expected nothing, but it seemed like I didn't know what to think. So it was just like a jump off a cliff. Not sure what was going to be at the bottom. And... Uh, uh, you know, and so it seemed like this will be worth a try. Let's see what happens. <laughs> you know, like it wasn't more sophisticated than that. Yeah. And then our business plan was that we were going to get on, I think, 60 stations by the end of the first year in national distribution. Which would give you enough because you, you had gotten a grant, right, from the corporation? We'd gotten a grant, firm. not from Corporation Pope. Or John from D. And some, the the MacArthur. MacArthur Foundation. Or, yeah. And, um, so the revenue would give you enough to sustain itself. Like from Again, the way it. that we do it here in the United States is that they, you can get grant money at the beginning. But then you're expected to like become proper capitalists and find ways, get an audience and get underwriters who will pay to put messages out in front of that audience, even on the public radio, and uh, you know get your show onto radio stations who will pay you money to put the show on, you know, in fees. And so the whole idea is, you know, you have to really get to a proper business plan pretty fast, and. Uh, and so, so you know, we 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 were on I think 112, 115 stations by the end of the first year, and then, and then we got a distributor. Like that was just us calling stations. Like there was somebody on my staff half time, Andrea DeFotis, who uh, who would call program directors and send them cassettes. It's that long ago. And if they picked up the show, they would get a Snickers bar. Um, that was part of our pitch. We would mail them a Snickers bar. Just once, people. though. Just once. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, it wasn't we, like we weren't an obvious bet at all. And at the time, not not much new was happening on public radio in the states. And at the time, we sounded more different than everything else. Like now, people are used to the sound of our show, and it just is sort of part of the sound of public radio in the United States. But at the time, you got letters at the time that said, uh, you know, oh, complaining years. like, "Where's when's the adult going to yeah, show yeah, up?" Yeah, yeah, no, very much so. Yeah, yeah, and program directors would say it to us. That say, like, yeah, like, like they tell you, like, work on, like, develop a, a more radio voice or something. Like, what, what would they say? I mean, you know, there's, there's, um. 
you know, there's a guy who's one of the big programmers at NPR now, um, who at the time, like, you know, we liked each other. We'd known each other for years. He's like, this is a really good show. Like, you got to get a host. Like, who's going to host it? Like, you got to get some money so you can afford a decent host. Like, that's the problem. This is after you've already been on for several months or something. Yeah. Like, and, and he wasn't being mean. He's just like, this is just not what stations will pick up. Like, like he was just a, running a business. You know, he's like, he's like, I know the public radio system. No one has hosted a show that sounds like you and is talking so casually and slurring his words and not enunciating and just, you just... You know, and and from uh, program directors, I had been a reporter on on the daily news shows before that, and people were just like, well, you know, he's a really good reporter. Like we always like his stories, but not so much as host. Usually, but like there should be an adult. Host. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like like where is the official kind of broadcaster who's going to be the host? And uh, you know, that was a problem. Was that worrying to you? I mean, was that tough to take, or did you have the confidence by then that you had, you know? that there was value in, in your voice and, and in doing it the way that you had developed? I mean, I didn't have a choice. I couldn't afford to hire anybody else, and so it wasn't even a question that I thought about. But would you have considered it? If I had more money, yeah, I would have. I totally would have. And I'd always produced, I, you know, I'd produced other people for years. And uh, And I feel like like I'm a, I'm a, like I feel like I do a perfectly good job hosting the show, but you know, somebody else could do it as well or better. Like when Nancy Updike fills in as host or Sarah Koenig, um, you know, I feel like they're just as good as me. People are just used to me, right? And now you you get comments like uh, you have such a good radio voice. That said, always right? kills me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I'll be at a public radio event and people say you have such a good voice for radio. I was like, no, you don't understand. Like I don't actually have a good voice for radio. Listen to people who have a good voice for radio and then listen to me. What I have is an utterly normal voice, just like yours. But through repetition, it seems like it should be on the radio, but it probably you know it's like the strange band name that you just you know if they become big, it becomes just yeah yeah it just becomes a thing. Or like Mick Jagger once said about what makes a hit song, somebody asked him and he said, repetition. And so was there a point when you felt confident in terms of the show as this staying thing, this thing that had found it? It seemed like by five or six years in, we were on pretty solid ground and I didn't have to wonder, are we going to make enough money to be on the air another year? And at that point, the audience was big enough. Um, that you had enough, like before that, it was a question whether or not if you could raise enough uh, yeah. funds each year? Well if, well, if you think about the problem, like you have to get onto stations and you have to get numbers of people and then you use those numbers of people as a way, as an excuse to build stations for, you know, like, look at all the people who are on your station are listening to our show. Like, you should pay us for that. But then also like to, to get underwriting where people will pay to put little announcements on the show, you know, 15 seconds long just to like, because they want to reach that audience. And so, so there's a numbers pressure, which I don't mind. Like, I don't mind the business of it. Like, I don't mind, I don't mind the fact that like we have to, like, run a nice business. Like, I'm for that. I think that that makes you better. Well, you actually started off creating promos. It seems like you you sort of like the challenge of of raising money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're here in our offices doing this interview, you'll see like postcards from our first year on the air. Like when we one one of the business problems that. We like I just I didn't know what it is to start a show, so I would call around to people who had done it. So so when so people told me here's here's a problem you're going to have, um, a lot of shows are trying to get on these stations, so you can't charge them for the first year at all, because somebody who isn't charging them is going to come in and get a new slot. So you can't charge them. So then you're on the station for a year, and then at some point you're going to want to charge them because you can't survive if you don't get money out of these stations, and they should be paying right. And so and so and I said, well, how many do you lose when you start to charge? And everybody's like, you're going to lose fifteen percent. That's the of the stations. You're going to lose fifteen percent of your audience. Yeah, of the stations. You lose fifteen percent of the stations. And I was like, I don't think we're going to be on enough stations that we can afford to lose fifteen percent. And so and so, what we did is here in the states, they have to, to all the stations have to raise money in, in pledge drives, and uh, where they go on the air and they ask listeners for donations, and they're pretty dreadful. Usually, they're boring. They're not done so well. And so we, so I would create these little modules that were two and three and four minutes long that were super funny. 
where I would call listeners and I would call businesses and try to get stuff for free. Like listeners get from us, they get stuff for free. You know, they get the radio show for free. They don't have to pay. And I was like, well, I just want to get what our listeners have with us. You know, what I want is, you know, and you know, there'd be like these funny little things that we would make. Um, and, uh, and uh, we would tell stations, don't even run them during our show. You know, just run them during your drive time when you have the most listeners, morning edition, you know, you know you drive time in the morning, you know, drive time in the afternoon and uh, and see how they do. And, and, and if you look around the office, like there are these postcards from program directors, like, you know, a station in Boston. I remember they would run one of these promos and they would make $35,000 in five minutes. Like people would just go crazy, partly because they you just they were just relieved to be entertained instead you know? of just what you would normally hear. The normal the pleading, yeah. yeah, and um and uh, they were just very very effective. And you know, thirty five thousand dollars was so much more than we were going to ask them. You know, we and were going we we the... to charge them, you know, ten thousand dollars to take the show for a year, fifteen thousand dollars. You know, and 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 so so when we were first trying to get onto stations, like there became a buzz among stations about like these pledge spots, which is they 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 are amazing. And and I remember um, the person who was doing a marketing, Andrea DeFoto, she would say, like, people would call all the time and they wanted to get the pledge spots. And she'd be like, you have to take the show. You can put us on at a terrible time. You have to put us on the radio. You can't get the pledge spots. And she says that half of the stations we got on of the first hundred stations, they they picked us up for the pledge spots. Which were created, crafted for, like, directed toward, like, if it was WBUR in Boston. No, was... we wouldn't say BUR at all. You we wouldn't? Just, no, no. They, we would say, you know, at the end of it, it ends with me saying, like, here's the number to call. And then they just live say their number. For the, that station? You know, yeah. Just for the local stations to use whenever they want to use them, whenever they think they need to make money. And um, those were so successful, that got us onto half our stations. I mean, you know, then, then other stations, like the program directors heard the show and they liked it and they wanted to put us on. Like yeah. we got on in Los Angeles because the program director heard it and she's just like, I think this is the future. And, like, you know, I want you on my show. You know, I want you on the air. Like, <laughs> we, we went on the merits sometimes. But my feeling was, and we send out, you know, messaging to the stations where I would say, like, don't pick us up because we're, like, trying to remake what public broadcasting is and what broadcasting is. Like, don't pick us up because we're idealistic and, and trying to change the face of everything that we do on the radio. Don't do it for that. Do it because we'll make you money. That's, that's our proposition to you. Just pick us up. We'll make you a lot of money. We'll make you more money than anybody makes you. That's, that's why you should pick us up. And I feel like I didn't care if people picked us up for good reasons or bad reasons. I just wanted to be on the radio. I just needed to get on the radio. And, um, and it must have been very exciting as you like check different places off that you were signing up. Oh, my up. God. It was so amazing to get stations, and like it was so amazing that it worked, and like and it was like and I and you know you can tell excited I get when I tell the story, like like I you know it it's fun, to, like running a business is really enjoyable if it goes well, you know, and and I liked the business part of it, and and you know one of the things that I'm proud of is 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 like you know I think that I think that we're making a you know I think that we're making a radio show that's as good as as we can make as a staff. Like, I think that, that or I think that we make a really nice show for people. Like, I think we really do. Like, we work hard to try to make it good and try to make it different and try to, you know, like, we're ambitious. And, uh, but I'm also proud that, like, the business side of it works great and we run a surplus every year that then we can invest in special projects and, you know, we can start new things and, and, uh, and people get paid well and the staff gets bigger over time, which means that we can we can take more time on stories. I mean, Harper High School was three reporters in a high school for five months. Like, very few news organizations can afford that. You know, mm-hmm. you have to be a big news organization. And, you know, we're just a staff of a dozen people. But, like, a dozen people is enough for, for this. And, uh, you know, and I feel like, I don't know, I mean, I've... I've I feel proud that the business runs and that everybody's doing okay and that, that I don't have to worry about the payroll. And So you don't miss the the hunt of it that you you must have had in those first few years? Well, there's always a new hunt. Like like we're doing this show at the Brooklyn Academy of Music that we're throwing hundreds of thousands of dollars at and it includes a Broadway musical and it includes, you know, just like it's crazy where you have 50 actors and singers and musicians and, and uh, you know, and so to... to Make just to come out at zero, just to make our money back. You know, we're going to try to offer videos online the same week as it's on the radio, and you have to pay five bucks if you want to see it. And so, hopefully, you know, we'll get enough people to get the videos that that will come out ahead. 
Like, and so there's always like a new thing to, to fuss with. Which is so interesting because it's like you went into it, obviously not for the money, and you talked about how little money you made, and yet yes. you really like that aspect of it, of, of not making money, but, you know, that that sort of business operating a, a, a company almost, a, an organization. It is running a company, yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 it's not my own yeah. company. Yeah, it's a not-for-profit company that isn't out to make, you know, profits for a shareholder or for any of us, but, like, we're just out to, like, make good stuff and or stuff that we like, and and it's nice to work for that. So it's coming up on 20 years uh, you all have been on the air. This American Life will have been on the air. I think uh, you went on the air in like November 1995. So we're, we're getting close. Is there anything that, that surprises you almost 20 years on about the direction the show has taken, how, how you've evolved, how the staff uh, and the organization has evolved? Or has it just been so busy that you haven't even had a chance to really sort of look back and reflect on how things have changed? No, like, I've looked back and reflected. I mean, we did a 500th episode not that long ago. And so so I think we all, you know, thought a lot about, like, like where have we been as a staff and, like, where are we going? And, and uh, I mean, I think the thing that I didn't know to anticipate was what it was going to be like someday to work with so many people who were so good at making radio stories. Like... When when the show started, <laughs> I mean, I don't say this in an egotistical way, but like I didn't know anybody else who who was as ambitious about making stuff for the radio. And I mean, I knew a couple people, but you know, but they were like, you know, there was like Jay Allison, who was often Cape Cod, and there was you know Joe Richmond, who was off in New York City, and there was Dave Isay, who was off in New York City. Like there were a couple of the Kitchen Sisters, you know, like that. That's almost the entire list, actually. Like that's almost everybody, and then. And but we didn't really work together. Like everybody's off doing their own thing. And then the thought that like I would be working in an office with like a dozen people, whose whose take on how to make stories is so they're so skilled and they're so interesting. And 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 see things that I'd never see. You know, like have ideas for stories that I'd never have. Um, and you know, there was a point early on when every edit went through me and everything like I was really like in charge of everything all the time and I was like this is not the way to do it and I like I was just like I need to have somebody else who will run this with me and kind of consciously made it so that Julie Snyder you know would would do that and you know and now like she's such a powerhouse you know like she's so good and um like I don't think I had the imagination to understand like how nice this would be, um, you know. Like I work with like they're like the Avengers or something. Or they're like the best anywhere at what they do. I think, and uh, and I like them. Like we all get along. Like it's a nice thing to like be in a group of a dozen people who get along and understand each other and get to make something. And you know, and it was like that somewhat after a couple of years when it was just four of us, um, you know, it felt like we had each other's backs in a nice way. But this is so, it's, this is so, it's, it's, it's just so different than I, than I was able to imagine and so much better. And? Like, it's just, it's, it's a pleasure. I don't know. Like when I was younger, I was like more selfish of a producer, you know what I mean? Like, and, and I felt more of a need to do every single thing myself. But uh, but now I don't have to feel that way because I work with people who are so good, you know? And so it's fine if I work on some given story and it's fine if somebody else does. It'll be just as good, you know? And uh, I don't know. Like some of our story meetings, I just feel so, it's just very pleasant. Being part of a team, getting yeah. to make stories. And also kind of a pain in the ass sometimes because <laughs> everybody has different opinions and you have to work it out and and all that. Like it's, you know, like there, there are definitely edits that I come out of where we're editing somebody's story and we don't agree and I just want to kick everybody. But but uh, but generally, no. No, they're, they're pretty awesome. And do you have a balance with the show now? I mean, I read an interview with you, I think from New York Times Magazine where you were talking about making these promos back in like 19, 
98 or, or something like that. And uh, it talks about how you work like 80 hours a week and how that the night before you'd only slept a, a few hours. Has it gotten to the point where you can have a, a bit more of a, of a balanced life or is it still almost all consuming for, for most of the year? I mean, there, I do go through phases where I'm working all the time, for sure. Um, but I don't have to. And to get the actual radio show on the air, like, I definitely don't have to. Like, the reason why I'm working all the time is because we're pitching movies and we're, you know, we're doing, a, we're doing, we're hiring 50 people to be on stage at the Brooklyn Academy of Music and, you know, and I'm touring with a dance show and, you know, like that, you know, it's just like, so, so if I didn't do the, that extracurricular stuff, then, uh, you know, it would actually be a, a very sane sort of job. Well, it's uh, certainly influenced a lot of people, and it's always exciting to see what new projects and what incredible new worlds you, you'll bring us into each week. So, Hourglass, thanks for doing the show, and thanks for doing the interview. Sure. Thanks for having me. Well, that was my interview with Hourglass, the host and founder of This American Life. And that's uh, Ready Waves for this week. And I'll be back in two weeks' time with a new episode. If you like the show, if you could help us spread the word, either by recommending it to a friend or rating the podcast on iTunes, it would be a big help. Music in the show was provided by The Years and Pottington Bear, both found at the Free Music Archive. And our logo was designed by Joseph Nowak. We're on Facebook and Twitter. And our website is readywaveshow.com. And there you can find all the interviews we've done with the voices of public radio. And if you have any comments, I'd love to hear from you. My email is kevin at thepublicradio.org, and I do my best to respond to everything that you send. I'm Kevin Caners. See you next time. <laughs>